Following the fight, a week or two passes, something conveyed to us as we go through the daily routine of Pyrrha Nikos a number of times. While it's primarily done to give the viewer a sense of time passing, it's also done to establish a temporary shift in character focus, swapping the protagonist hat from Ruby to Pyrrha for the next few episodes. There are brief glimpses of the normalcy she feels around her friends, the exhaustion she feels while training with both John and on her own, and the burst of activity when fans come up to her after certain classes asking for autographs and the like. We see maybe about three or four of these repetitions before we stop in the middle of one, right in the midst of one of Ublek's lectures. He's explaining that he's assigning a partner project covering how the Great War of Remnant bled into the Faunus Rebellion as one of the final assignments of the year, and the caveat is that the partner cannot be from one's own team. It must be someone from another team in order to encourage understanding and communication between members outside of their own teams. Ruby and Juniper are of course excited about it and pair off with each other, and in fact Ruby excitedly makes everyone draw straws between them. This results in Pyrrha being placed with Ruby, Nora being placed with Blake, Ren being placed with Weiss, and John being placed with Yang. John is vocally disappointed about not being put with Weiss, and Pyrrha takes that heart-wrenching complaint in stride with an awkward smile. However, if you remember, they aren't the only focal characters present in this particular class. Velvet and Cardin are also there. Because she doesn't socialize with anyone outside of Ruby and Juniper, and because most people just generally don't like Cardin, the two of them are left unpaired, which unfortunately ends up with Ublek partnering them to each other. Immediately sensing the unease between the two and knowing their history, Pyrrha jumps to volunteer as Cardin's partner so Velvet can partner with Ruby. However, Ublek observes the situation and denies the request, saying that it's important for certain frictions to be dealt with while in training where it's safe instead of out in the field where failing to communicate would lead to a death sentence. He dismisses the class and Velvet, after taking a deep breath, approaches Cardin about the project only to be brushed off as he makes his way out the door. We catch up later with Ruby and Pyrrha in the library, where they're researching the topic of the Great War. While there, they run into Penny, who manages to pull Ruby aside and explain what was going down the other day at the CCT. Penny had been receiving an update to her software from her father, something large enough to warrant going to the CCT for a transfer. She's been allowed to attend Beacon as an Atlas student, though she's been told not to interact with Ruby. Ruby introduces her to Pyrrha, and the three hit it off just fine. As is Ruby's natural tendency, she's gotten a couple of questionable sources for their paper, among them two or three children's fairy tales that lighten up the events of the war and conflict into more digestible bites for kids. Ruby finds herself especially drawn to a young adult adaptation of one of the battles of the war, let's call the Siege of Grimrock, wherein an Atlesian troops use a subterranean infiltration as a distraction while Mistral's force is dropped in from above. The story is told from a younger girl's perspective and how she heroically helps Vale and Vacuo fight off the threat, but it's mostly played off as a parody of the glorification of war. But we also know this is heavy foreshadowing for what's to come in both this season and the next. The three discuss the efficacy of children's stories, and Pyrrha and Penny in particular are find common ground with their mutual favorite story, the Tale of the Four maidens. Peter remembers it being told to her as a child, and Penny fondly remembers it being read to her by her father back when she was a brand new AI, though she skirts around revealing her mechanical nature to Pira. CL, making her first appearance, arrives in the library and interrupts this little bonding session, dragging Penny off to do schoolwork and repeating the rule that she's not supposed to be associating with security risks. As she's dragged away, Penny tries to explain that Ruby is harmless, and CL simply says to take it up with Ironwood when she sees him next. As Ruby and Pyrrha leave the library, incidentally around the same time as Nora and Blake, who were chilling in the background for the entire sequence doing their own work, they catch sight of Velvet and Cardin embroiled in an argument. Cardin is of course more than furious he has to work with a critter like Velvet on schoolwork, and Velvet is equally as frustrated that he's not pulling his own weight on the project. He doubles down saying that the only reason Faunus have rights is because Vel's king went delirious in his old age, and of course Velvet argues back that the king was an inspiration to his people and just wanted to do justice by everyone. Ruby and Pyrrha step in, with Ruby suggesting the two do the research apart and see who comes out the closest to the truth. Cardin bites back, calling Ruby a sympathetic faunus jockey and stating that he doesn't need to prove anything. Velvet steps up and agrees to the terms. The focus of their paper will be about the King of Vale as both the hero of Vital and as the man who ended the oppression of the faunus. She argues that they'll both take opposing directions on the paper. She would cover it from the perspective that the king was right-minded and did the right thing, and Cardin would cover it from the angle that the king had lost his mind. He crosses his arms, still very angry, but agrees saying that it's the first bit of sense he's heard out of the Farnes' mouth. When he leaves, the three, then five with Blake and Nora, watch and appreciate just how rough Velvet has it. 
All the same, Velvet is concerned about her grades, stressing that she'd already flunked out of this class once, and if she failed again, she could very well be held back. The last scene is in Downtown Vale, where we finally get what was originally the opening scene of Volume 2, with Emerald and Mercury tracking down Tuxen's book trade. There aren't any major differences, maybe cleaning up some of the dynamic in the relationship so Emerald telling Mercury to shut up actually makes sense, but just about everything else is the same until it gets to the list of books that Emerald starts mentioning to the increasingly concerned Tuxen. The first book she mentions is in stock, but after that he becomes more and more disturbed as the titles become more specific, ones that are out of stock because he lent them out to friends like he'd mentioned to Sun and Blake. Tuxen catches on to what's happening, and Emerald catches on to that, breaking the charade as Mercury lowers the lights and the scene plays out like it did before, though now with several dozen doses of context that help us, the audience get more than invested in Tuxen dying. R.I.P. in peace, Tuxen. You were a good kid. Sliding right into episode 8, we open with Ospin and Ruby talking in the immediate aftermath of the Paladin incident, with Ruby laying out everything her team learned and did during the events of episodes 4 through 6. Ospin takes all the information in stride, giving the patented wise old mentor nod as she finishes. He thanks her for bringing all this to his attention and promises to confer with the other headmasters and the council on the matter. For now, Ruby should focus on her schoolwork and the upcoming dance, goading her to enjoy being a student while she still is one. We get a close-up of her concerned face only to cut comedically to her struggling to keep her eyes open. Her, Pira, Sun, and Neptune are interviewing Port for their papers, and the lecture has devolved into a battle of wills to stay awake. Pira, the dutiful student, manages to do so far easier than Ruby and has to keep nudging her to keep her awake. Sun, however, has passed out and Neptune isn't far behind. There's maybe one or two small gags here to put the meeting wraps up quite quickly. Out in the hall, Ruby and Pira confer notes, with Ruby still being a little bleary-eyed over the personal lecture. Sun and Neptune fill in a little dialogue as well, maybe clearing up exactly how small details like classes for temporary transfer students work while they're at Beacon, but ultimately they're mostly just in this small swath of scenes to maintain presence in the series and spice up the environment a little bit. The four head their separate ways, with Pyrrha going off to a room to start on the body of their paper, while Ruby heads off to meet her team for some after-hours practice. When she gets close to the dorm, she runs into Nora, who is also on her way back from working with Blake, and is chomping at the bit to see Ren since he's making some pancakes for them all tonight. As they walk down the dormitory hall, they hear Cardin yelling at his teammates. The two peek around the corner to find Cardin pinning Russell to a wall, enraged and shouting over how few resources Russell, Dove, and Skye managed to scrounge up for Hazen Velvet's history paper. Nora, pure soul that she is, wants to step in and stop him, but Pira holds her back. They continue listening and pick up on tidbits from Cardin's team, namely that he's been monopolizing their time to help him outdo Velvet on the paper, which has eaten into their time to work on their own papers. As well, Cardin seems flustered over the situation, with his hair disheveled and the way he lashes out being far more primitive. Nora begins to tug away from Pira, only for Pira to suddenly let go and step up from behind the wall, eyes glaring down at Cardin. Nora very quickly follows behind. She stomps forward, accusing him of being a terrible leader, manipulating his subordinates like they're his own personal waitstaff. Cardin, surprised and somewhat confused, stomps towards her and asks why she's always sticking her nose in his business. She replies, rather sharply, that everyone should take issue with what he's doing, and she's more surprised so many people are turning a blind eye to his behavior. Russell, dinged up a bit from Cardin's mini rampage, answers before Cardin can that the Winchester name carries a lot of political sway in the kingdom, and so many people don't interfere on that basis. Pyrrha and Nora share a glance, with Nora even voicing the question over how John's blackmail over Cardin has any weight if that was the case. Cardin doesn't respond to either of them and instead slaps Russell over the head, but that just prompts Pyrrha to jump forward and defend him. She explains that doing nothing but berating and belittling his team will only hurt their joint performance. Cardin asserts that this is the only way to make an effective team, to rule with an iron fist as every generation of Winchester has. Pyrrha pauses, thinking it over for a minute before looking him dead in the eye, asking him if he'd be willing to put a wager on it. Cardin is confused, but she elaborates. If Cardin's team is really so effective with all he's putting them through, then they'd really have no problem beating just Pyrrha in a 4v1 fight. Cardin asks what the ante is, and she replies smoothly that she'll keep her nose out of his business going forward. But, if she wins, he has to put his bias aside and actually work with Velvet on making a genuinely good paper. Cardin is wary of the terms, but she adds a cherry on top. If she loses, it'll technically be her first loss ever, and all credit for beating the Invincible Girl will go to Cardin's leadership. Nora tries to butt in, saying she wants to join to make things more even for Pira's side of the board, something that Pira is momentarily confused by, before Pira rejects the idea. She clarifies it's important to be one-on-four to get the point across. Cardin is so deep in thought that he misses this small back and forth, but he ultimately accepts the terms and leaves, eager to see her at the next sparring class. Nora whines that she wants to break his legs as he walks away, but Pira appeases her by reminding her of Ren's pancakes and the two head off for dinner. 
We cut ahead to the day of the challenge with John outside the locker room with Pira, him of course asking if she really wants to go through with it. After all, Cardin's not a pushover and John does still have his trump card. Pira declines and explains what Russell said, though John acts unsurprised. Having grown up in a similar structure, he was suspicious of what kind of sway Cardin's family had. All the same, he points to the fact that the blackmail did work and that it must mean they hold some weight over Cardin. Considering Cardin's behavior, he guesses the troublemaker isn't on the most stable ice with his family, and something as catastrophic as forgery could be embarrassing enough to warrant cutting him away from their shielding. Pira, still uneasy by the answer, reaffirms her desire to make an example of him, to see how weak being a bully like him makes people. John appreciates it, and the two stand there awkwardly, looking at each other. Eventually, she asks him to wish her luck, which he does, and they say their goodbyes. We fade away as she enters into the locker room. We finally get to see the scene that was cut from the first episode of the volume where Roman, Cinder, Mercury, and Emerald all trade quips and verbal blows over the killing of Tuxen, though now the White Fang Lieutenant is involved as well. In fact, it's the Lieutenant who requested Tuxen and his associates be tracked down and killed, as they had been aiding turncoats and escaping the White Fang. He explains that after seeing Blake in the city, he figured that she had to have had help getting herself set up, so via Cinder, he asks Mercury to track down everyone responsible. Mercury rambles off a number of clues and ticks that led him to every single member of this underground railroad, a term that's deliberately dropped here for irony's sake given the end of this season, establishing him as the most observant member of the villain's crew. Roman is angry over Tuxen's network being eliminated so tactlessly, saying that while his robbery style isn't exactly subtle, he doesn't do anything that isn't absolutely necessary. Anything more just increases the chances of getting caught. This is where Cinder comes in to intimidate Roman into calming down, and the scene plays out almost in parallel with what actually happened, though maybe throwing in a line or two to the lieutenant to keep him prominent. Otherwise, with the changes we've made already in the former sections of this season, the scene works almost perfectly as is. Episode 9 opens just as the original Episode 5 did, with Pira gearing up and fighting Team Cardinal, though now we actually have some stakes to the fight. Additionally, there's a small bit before the fight really kicks off where Nora is pushing Professor Goodwitch to allow her to fight as well, but Glinda dismisses Nora, saying that Pira made her challenge very clear and that someone as talented as Miss Nikos knows her own limits. All the same, the fight doesn't play out too differently aside from being extended to be more thematically fitting, with Pira quite easily dismantling any tactic Cardin throws at her. Small touches, though, do help, making Cardin more desperate as the fight goes on and conveying that through body language, would be a must when it came to directing this scene. After besting him, Pira offers a hand to Cardin. It's clear at this point the boy has reached critical mass on his emotions, and his composure is so broken that he almost takes it. However, he has enough self-respect to shunt it away and stands up on his own. As he and his teammates limp away, Pira reminds him of their wager, which he grunts to acknowledge. She doesn't stop there though, leveraging that he should definitely put his best foot forward when he works with Velvet, not just alongside her. That gives him a moment of pause before he finishes walking to the locker rooms. Glinda addresses the crowd for new volunteers, not singling out Blake this time because Blake isn't distraught by anything, and Mercury leaps to the chance to test Pira. The skirmish is short, he gets what he wants, and we're on to the period just after class where Sun is trying to break up a dispute between Neptune and Coco over something trivial, probably about designer brands or appropriate headgear. Y steps in and adds her own commentary to the matter, creating a friendly three-way argument that Ruby and John tried to break up. While this goes on, Blake and Peter notice Velvet walking towards them, most likely to link up with Coco, only for Cardin to come limping out of the combat hall. He notices her, spares a glance to Pira, and approaches Velvet, to which she reflexively flinches. He asks if she's free Thursday night before dinner, and she tentatively responds in the positive. The argument in the background dies down as Coco is now watching, taking on an aggressive posture in case Cardin tries anything. Cardin leaves no room for question with Velvet, as he simply tells her to meet him in the library and to bring her stupid notes because his sources weren't panning out. He shoves past them and leaves with the rest of his team also limping in tow. Velvet blinks, confused about what just happened, and Pira smiles, lying that perhaps Cardin had a change of heart after all. Coco looks over her sunglasses at Pira questioningly before offering a sly, understanding smile. She doesn't know what it happened exactly, but she can tell that Pira did something to mess with Cardin's head, and it doesn't go unappreciated. All but Coco go off to lunch, during which Nora boldly challenges everyone to an arm wrestling competition. She wins against just about everyone, though it's shown that Pira puts up a good fight before going down. There's a small amount of smug satisfaction on Nora's face over that, though it's quickly wiped off when Yang gives her a run for her money. However, in the middle of this, Weiss takes note of what Blake is eating and actually asks how much influence her Fauna's heritage has on what she likes, noting how often Blake eats fish. This makes Blake cough in place and distracts Yang from the competition, making her lose. Blake, of course, glares at Weiss's opinion, saying that it's not exactly polite to just ask something like that, but Weiss shakes her head and explains quite limply that she's just trying to understand how Faunus work firsthand. Most of the resources she's going to trust over the years offer much less flattering analysis of Faunus sociology, so she didn't want to go to a poisoned well for information. Blake digests what Weiss says, and Ruby pops in wondering if things are going to be okay. Blake says that they're fine, and in fact, she's happy that Weiss is trying to be considerate, even if it was unintentionally rude. She recommends they go to Tuxin to talk about what books he might have that can help Weiss better understand understand Fauna's society. 
Weiss is a little uneasy, especially after creating a small gaffe for herself, but she appreciates that Blake is willing to help. We cut to them in the evening, walking the streets of Vale on their way to Tuxens, with Blake trying to convey that being a faunus is less being a human with animal attributes and more being their own metric to base themselves on. It's not that the heritage influences their taste so much as it's just a part of who they are. Even animals have unique preferences. While Weiss is struggling to wrap her mind around the concept, Blake admits she's probably not describing it as well as she could. Finally, the two enter Tuxens' bookstore and find it dark, with Blake ignoring the curiously placed clothes sign with her own key. I mean, she lived there for a brief spell, she would have one. After investigating in the shadows for a tense minute or two, they wander upon Tuxen's body in the back of the store, horrifying both of them. Cut to black, the episode ends. Before we hop away from this episode, I want to put some extra emphasis here that this is an important moment for Weiss, and her reaction in this scene needs to sell it. This is the first instance where she sees a dead Faunus, and all those sound bites about Faunus being just as morally valuable as humans comes crashing home for her. After this point, general interactions between her and Blake are going to be much softer, and her interactions with Faunus will be less haunted by her upbringing. It's still present, but this is where we start to see it phased out more extremely. This isn't to say we're going to be ignoring Blake in this scene, no, she's center focus, but it's important to note that death has a way of sobering people and making them take a step back for self-reflection. Thank you for watching Section 2 of Fixing Ruby Part 4. I'd love to give a big shout out to all of my wonderful patrons who have each helped this channel grow into what it is today. If you want to support the channel, please consider donating at patreon.com slash culticphoenix. Remember, by donating $1 or more, you can get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server, where personalities like myself, Fatman Falling, and Tom Horan of Six Lick Productions regularly interact with our supporters. Please stick around for the next installment, and I'll catch you all on the flip side.